I would like to move on. And we have a powerhouse panel for you right now, a financial uh, strength panel. And I'd like to first introduce Mr. Ray Reed from Eastern Region, who started with us in 2004 and is at 2.7 million and counting. Um, Ray has broken numerous regional and national uh, records. Fun fact, the most orders he's had in a day were 46. His biggest week ever was 51,350 and his best year was 421,798. So I thought that was really cool and I would love to hear more of those um, from people. I think it's pretty interesting to hear what somebody's biggest day and week was. Um, it's always fun. Something that I think is really cool is that he has worked less than 100 days the last four years, which meaning last year he worked 100 days and the year before that he worked 100 days and he truly is successful and he's also um, involved in many other things with his time. So I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, he's doing something right. Ray was married in 2017 to his lovely wife and they are expecting their first child this summer, which is very, very exciting. I'm sure he's going to have a mini or she will have a mini grill set because I know he's a big fan of the grill. Every time I watch Instagram, I am immediately starving. Um, let's see here. What else do we got? We have, he's been to Europe three times along with numerous big city trips in the last 24 months, which is pretty cool. And Ray is a diehard Boston Red Sox fan. And he also can join Dave Bush in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan club. So yeah, we have yeah. Mr. Ray Reed. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to also introduce Mr. Josh Muller. He is from Southwest Region and started in 2001. He's currently over 8.1 million in career sales. Josh has won multiple silver cups and he's already over 260 for this year. He and his wife, Amy, own multiple rental properties and have been able to make multiple smart long-term investments um, as a result of their dedication to discipline and, and their saving goals. Uh, he's a big fan of comedy shows, loves a good live show of music, and he is an experienced world traveler. Last uh, but not least, we have Mr. Jason Jeffrey, who is joining us as well from Southwest Region. Just over six million in career sales, has broken multiple national push week records. Um, not sure if you've seen this, but it's pretty amazing. And I guess we'll see what he does tomorrow when we do the live push. Um, it'll be pretty exciting. Jason is well diversed in finances. He's able to make smart decisions with taking the emotions out of it, um, which I think we would all love to be able to do. So hopefully he shares some magic there. He also has um, invested very well. So he's able to sleep at night. And a fun fact, he has saved for trips that cost over $40,000 to take. So um, interested, you know, all I can do is get to the, Jer the Jersey Shore. So I'm gonna be paying attention to this message. Um, he's able to do all this while raising two beautiful kids, Nova and Brecken, with his wife, Candace. And I'm pretty sure his children have been to more countries than I have in my 41 years on the earth. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our power panel. Take it away, guys. Josh, is this, is this me? Should I, yeah, should buddy, I, uh... you're good, Ray. Go for it, bud. <clears throat> all right, man. Thank you, brother. So yeah, guys, um, I think we're each gonna share about 10 minutes and we're gonna share some, some tactics, some strategies, some, some ideas and whatnot. For me, I broke it down simple. Three, three ways that I think about money. You make it, you keep it, and you grow it, right? So I'll talk a little bit, just very quickly about making it. Um, I think that that's what, I mean, you guys are doing it right now. You're on this call. This is gonna be stuff that's gonna help you make that money. We're gonna talk about that just a little bit. I'll spend a little bit more time on keeping it and growing it because that's what's exciting to me about you know finances. So the first couple points that I have on, on making it, the number one thing that I think about is, uh, or the first thing I should, I should say that I think about is profit over prizes. It's just a little saying, right? I was on a federal call, you know, recently, and it was, um, you know, Matt Warren and Kareem were talking about some ideas. Um, and, you know, average order is this big number that we all put, put out there. Uh, but, you know, I think we can get wrapped up in some of those things, or maybe it's just during the pushes and the prizes. The prizes are awesome. And making, you'll make money if you're winning prizes for sure. But just something I've, I've seen reps coming up at least, maybe less so in the veteran veteran reps, but I've seen reps that sacrifice profit for a little extra CPO during a, a, pri, a, um, you know, a push uh, or something like that. But 
guys, you know, we're in this for profit or, or they wouldn't sell smaller pieces or they refuse to sell one piece at a time. Look, I'm all about, you know, selling big and packaged deals and whatnot, but are we really sacrificing, you know, are you, I guess my question would be, are you guys hungry to sell a three pack of cutting boards to a customer at a show? Maybe you're not, maybe you're not hungry to do that, but you're doing it because you're every little Every dollar that you guys make is going towards that profit, that overall number that's going to create the financial freedom. So profit over prizes. Two other things that I got in the make it uh, department here, guys, is just an overall mentality. Okay, there's something I learned from uh, Tim Ferriss a long time ago. It's absolute income versus relative income. Those are two different ideas, and I'm not going to tell you which one. Uh, you know. I'm, it, it, all of us are in different situations with different goals. Absolute income would be a, a question that I'll ask you guys is who makes more money? The person that works 80 hours a week and makes 200 grand or the person that makes, that works 20 hours a week and makes a hundred grand. Okay. That's a decision. There's two right answers there, right? But that's a decision for you to think about what phase of life are you in? Are you all about the absolute income? Or are you about the relative income? And I think thinking about this can help help you gain some clarity around your financial goals and your, your actions that are going to lead to that financial freedom. So, and the, the, the follow-up question to that would be, do you know what your time is worth? This gets to be like a productivity question, but for me, it's also a financial question. I'm always uh, analyzing what my profit per hour is, uh, the different activities of the business. Maybe that's my marketing and my SE2 sales. Maybe that's uh, events, service events separately. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to analyze that on at least an annual basis where I say, okay, these are the shows that I made over a hundred dollars an hour. These are the shows that I made over $200 an hour. These are the shows that I made over $300 an hour. And I'm going to start doing like an 80, 20 exercise to remove some of those smaller ones or ask myself the question, what can I be do to, what can I be doing to make more money during this event? And at some point, maybe we're skimming some of those and I'm spending more time on the activities that I'm making more money on. So how aware are you, or how aware are you of the profit that you are making per activity that you do in the business? That's it for make it, guys. That's, that's what we're all doing. Like I said, we're learning how to make it. The second part of financial wealth or freedom or strengths is keeping it, right? So you heard Tane, I love Danny talking about like the forced savings in his last message. That's, that's perfect, right? So a, a thing that I, I would ask myself or kind of a quote that I came up with not too long ago was your spending is a direct reflection of your values. Your spending habits are a direct reflection of your values. Do you value freedom or do you value things? Do you value experiences or do you value things? And I'm not saying that things are bad guys, but are you focused more on the new shoes and the new outfit and the new car and, and whatnot? Or are you, you focused on eventually not having to ever work or only working when you want to? For me, that's the thing, right? Like I'm all about freedom. That's, I wanna wake up. I wanna only run the shows that I wanna run. I wanna only do the things that I wanna do, right? So for me, I'm gonna be very careful with how I spend money. Now I might spend money on a bunch of wine back here, but that's a value for me, it goes up in value. So you gotta pick those things that you might want, but understand that your spending is a direct reflection of your values. So Nicole and I each year, a little tactic on, on this topic, Nicole and I each year will do a, an expense audit. We'll go through all of our monthly bills and expenses all of those little random things that you do, like maybe you're on your apps or your subscription services, and we look at all of that, right? Or services that we do for the business or, or not. And we'll look, we'll look through all those things and we say, okay, where, what can we cut out? What do we not need? What is not bringing us joy or happiness or value right now? Um, you know, what, what can we get a better deal on? How can we consolidate these expenses? And we'll add all that up. And that might be an extra grand a year. It might be an extra 10 grand a year when you add up all of those monthly expenses. So um, keeping it thinking about auditing your expenses and what you got. And the third part, the third point that I have for keeping it that you must do, and I don't see enough vector reps do this, is hire professionals. It is worth it. Good ones, right? The good ones are going to cost more, but the good ones are going to help you keep your money. So when I say hire professionals, I'm talking about accountant, 
if you don't have an account and you're still just going to use a turbo tax or h h and r and you're making over let's call it 60 grand a year profit you you that's like the first thing that I would be doing uh, when I leave this call. And I'm sure Josh and Jason have awesome stuff to tell you. I did probably tell you the same thing, but hire a good account, number one. Number two, a financial advisor. At some point, you can do a lot of this passively, but at, at, a, at a certain level and in, in savings and, and wealth, you need to hire a professional to help you do that because that's what we're good at is selling knives. We're not, you know, there might be a couple of us in here that have some some superpowers on you know, picking stocks, but I doubt it, right? Like not on the level that they should. If they were, if they were really good at picking stocks, they wouldn't be selling Cutco, right? So hire a financial advisor. Number two, or, or the third, not like a, well, kind of under the hiring professional thing. I saw a lot of chatter the other day on FSM Magic that, um, you know, Josh commented on a couple other people asking about getting an LLC or an S Corp. Talk to your accountant, figure that out. I will tell you this, that I think that it's, all states differ, but I'm I'm pretty sure that if you are profiting over 40 or 50 grand or you're you're 1099 ing over 50 grand a year, it's going to have saved you money to do one of those things. I'm not going to tell you which one to do. You consult your your accountant on that, but you gotta hire professionals. That's gonna help you guys keep your money. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is kind of a transition into growing it. Uh, I am a fan of withholding because it is for savings. So using your vector withholdings, whether that's for events, whether that's for taxes, whether that's Smith Barney, whatever, I'm a fan of withholding, but I'm gonna go ahead and transition to the growing it part. I only hold my withholding in for a month and then I take it out because it's sitting in there not growing at all and it's not making any money. So I'm gonna take that out and I'm gonna put it in either, uh, the safest thing, right, would be like a high interest, you know, savings account, which you can look them up and go on bankrate.com, figure out which ones are higher or whatever at a minimum. But what you're really wanting to do is invest, right? So for Grow It, I got invest and then I've got you, I got investing in three different ways. Number one, the fastest way to grow your income and to grow your financial freedom, as long as you're doing the keeping it and growing it part uh, on top of this is invest in yourself. So invest in coaching, invest in reading, invest in the courses, invest in products, right? So invest, investing in yourself to do that. I think that all of us, our, mentor, our mentors or our coaches that you have, make it a focus. Like every time that I talk to my coaching clients, that's one of three big things. We talk about business, we typically talk about health, and we talk about finances, but that's a major portion of every single one of my conversations. So when you guys are vetting a, a potential coach or you're talking to your coaches, Help, if you don't have financial goals, talk to them about creating financial goals with you, but invest in yourself, invest in a coach that's going to help you financially, not just in the business. Number, the second way to invest is to invest in your business, right? So whether that's vast action or a better display or upgrading your, your ultimate set to ultimate set with steak knives instead of the old ultimate block with table knives still, do the little things that are going to increase that income those are two low hanging, low, low hanging fruit for increasing that income and growing the income that you're already making is investing in yourself, investing in your business. And then the last one would be obviously in to invest your money. And what I mean by that is, look, if you don't get your money to work for you, you'll always have to work for money. If you don't get your money to work for you, you'll always have to work for money. So, you know, again, talk to a financial advisor about this. But obviously, every year, Nicole and I max out our Roth, uh, our Roth IRA. It, it grows tax-free, so that's an easy way to grow your money. Number two, if you get an S-Corp or you're self-employed, there's two other ways to lower your, your tax uh, liability on an annual basis, and that's, between, that's a, SEP, a SEP and a solo 401k. If you have a lot of employees, if you're, a situ if you're in a situation where you have two or more assistants, I believe you can't participate in a couple of these. That's where you would talk to your financial advisor. If you don't have any employees other than you and your spouse, you would use a, a, a solo 401k. You can invest like up to, it's, uh, I think it's close to 60 grand, 58 grand this year. Again, I don't know the exact number, 58 grand per person that you're investing, but it's also coming off of your total uh, income for the year that you'll be taxed on by the IRS. 
And then I love what Danny said too, is just once you start putting in a small percentage of, of your income into these things, it becomes a game. It's the coolest thing to put money in and keep putting it in and watching that interest, that compound interest grow. Um, and, and, it, and it just creates momentum where it's like, man, you start thinking about things differently. You think about that $30,000 car that you might want to get, but what it would be, you know, let's say instead of doing a $30,000 car, you do a $15,000 car and you take that other 15 and you put it in, in a, an investment account and you watch it grow. When you guys start to see this and you put it as a habit to just consistently invest, it's going to become so big where it's like, so I'm, I'm never worried about paying my bills. Sometimes I'm just worried about whether I'm going to like max out everything that I possibly can. It's not, you want to have a, a buffer, but you want to be putting as much away as you can if you want to really expedite that stuff. So really that's all I got for you guys. Make it, keep it and grow it. Definitely the highlights would be, you know, what absolute income versus relative income. Your, your spending is a direct reflection of your values, hire professionals and invest in yourself, invest in your business and make your money work for you. So I got Josh. Awesome, thanks Ray. Thank oh yeah, Jason, I wanted to say, do you have three kids or two? I have three now, just December 28th, so no worries. Well, congrats, I did not know. And I guess, cause we haven't been on any trips. I haven't seen the little baby yet. So congratulations. And I was just gonna say, if you wanna take it away next and we'll finish with Josh. Perfect. Sounds good. And I really do wish I could have my video on today, but it's just not a good idea. And so I'm just going to dive in here, you guys, <clears throat> with this. Um, I know you've heard multiple people talk about saving or keeping money. Let me just give you an action step before I get to my three points. Either utilize number one, you, if you could take a note on this, if you, if you don't, if you heard it and you're like, all right, so am I going to do that? Maybe, maybe not. What do I need to do? Either utilize a Smith Barney account by just action step here, message your DVM, email your DVM about getting it set up. Or if you're not going to do that, you don't know, you don't care about the Smith Barney card. You don't want to restrict a percentage of your sales in your commission statements, and maybe that just doesn't vibe with you. Go, go two-step process here: set up a new bank account, and two, auto transfer $100 a month into the other account. I mean, it literally will take you like 20 minutes at the bank. It's not, and then you don't have to worry about it. Or 500, or a thousand, whatever you want, as long as it's something because that gets you started. So if you're not like don't already have some sort of automatic deduction system from the money that you have coming in going to some other place besides your one bank account that's one of your biggest first steps you need to take immediately and then you know i challenge you from there how many other automatic transfers can you have and so my first thing is diversify well and second is take the emotion out of money and three is invest you sleep well at night so get into these topics first with diversification like when COVID hit, my Airbnb is like tanked, but certain stocks in the market started killing it following COVID. So are you diversifying and are, are you paying attention to the trends that are happening on? Later in the year, I was able to pull 40 grand out of an insurance policy and use it to leverage in crypto to ride a bull market. And then in April, I paid myself back. So if you're diversifying and you have money in different places that are it's saved in different places, you can utilize strategies that nobody else could utilize or, or most people aren't utilizing, right? And you can, you can win, the, seize the day, seize your money to go to higher levels. You can diversify money into different categories, but then within those categories, you can diversify. So a couple of things here, uh, just random off the cuff with uh, regards to, there's no organization in regards to which one's a priority, but I recommend a second bank account outside of the country with a second emergency fund. If a banking system goes down or is in crisis, not every country shuts down the exact same day. You're also able to um, utilize that in different other ways as well, and you can research that. Uh, one thing, two, is I recommend um, certain type of life insurance policies that can allow you to stack cash into a different location. And uh, there are risks on the front end within the first few years you can research, um, but you know, on the back end, it can be a really, really powerful tax free way to utilize cash later in life and also have an emergency fund that's getting you, you know, a, a percentage versus just sitting in a bank. And next is crypto. Don't just buy Bitcoin buy altcoins, Ethereum, Stellar Lumens, and so on. You should have diversification in that arena if you're going to purchase in any cryptocurrency. There's a lot of like ups and downs that go. It's very, very uh, volatile. And uh, if you're diversified, that will help. 
Uh, with real estate, there's a dozen strategies in real estate. I recommend diversifying at least a couple of different ways within that. Um, and then with, your, with regards to like funds for yourself, there's like a kid's college fund, health savings account, which is called an HSA, solo 401k. These are all things you could have through one advisor. And that could be like diversifying among places within different accounts with that one advisor. You can just get an advisor. That's a traditional method there. You can also set up a Roth to allow over 40K a year per person to go in. You can do over $100,000 a year combined for a married couple into a Roth IRA. And I know that that may sound impossible to some of you, uh, but it is, it is possible. And so you just need to get the right financial advisors, get things lined up. And, um, and again, so diversifying is, is number one. Number two is take the emotion out of it. So most people fall, like they fail in their investments and, and grind their money when risk is involved. And so, I mean, a lot of people talk about like the safe plays and things like that, but where the biggest risk is also sometimes the biggest uh, reward. So I just want to like, you know, talk a little bit about that and how to take the emotion out of things and then how to sleep well at night to finish it off. The biggest factor I think is emotion. When things start going bad, they, people pull out their money, people panic. Um, so selling when things have already went down, it may seem like it will keep going down. I mean, you think like, you may think to yourself, um, you know, you're selling wallets going down, but oftentimes, you know, unless you have a tip or you're lucky, it's already too late. It's 90% of the time you already missed the boat. It's already went down. So since your investment went down in value, it's time to buy more of it at that value because the odds are 90% that it's going to go back up. The time to put more money in um, is when it's down. So if it's stocks or crypto or something, unless it's reached a 25 to 50% reduction in value from the peak when it started to decrease. So I would make a note of the, vol the volatility. It could be anywhere within 25 to 50% of the peak value of whatever it was. If it's gone below that, then you do want to, I mean, and also if a lot of different factors are happening in the market, you do want to make a decision whether or not it's time to like cash out if it's actually going to crash or something like that. But it's very rare that crashes happen. And most of the time people are just watching their money and like things start to go down and then it goes, and then they take their money out and then it goes back up. And it's just like this really silly process. So take the emotion out of it and understand that when you feel like you should be selling is probably when you should be buying. And when you feel like you should be buying, when it's a frenzy and everybody's buying and everybody's making tons of money in this market or that market or crypto or whatever, that is an indication where you should be cautious and realize that you're reaching a high and a lot of people know about it and everybody's getting in. And at that point, once everybody has all their money in and there's a lot of money in, where's it going to go from there except down? So that's when crashes happen, when it's crazy frenzies and stuff. And properties, you know, when a crash happens, when prop with regards to real estate, buy on the way down, buy at the bottom and on the way up. And when stocks are going down, buy along the way down is they'll eventually come back up unless you're buying highly speculative individual stocks. So one other thing you can do to help take, you know, um, with, with regards to investing in, in different like companies, if you're investing in solid companies with solid financials, I would make sure they have a strong corporate team who's also invested heavily in the company with their own money and are positioned. So that's important that they're actually invested in the, with their own money. They're motivated to grow the company. They're, they're also positioned in a way where their income is reflected based on the revenue of the company. And you can find all this stuff out and they're positioned along the right trends in the market. And they have good revenue and growing revenue. And then that, you know, that makes it work. So investing to sleep well at night, I was just reading Andrew Carnegie's autobiography. Actually, I've been reading it for a while. I kind of savoring the flavor with it and just like a little bit every single night. I think I read it every single night for over a hundred days right now, but I realize I'm half Scottish. I found out from my cousin who moved in with me and his girlfriend's my nanny now. And we're just reading all sorts of cool stuff that like with new meaning now, because Carnegie, um, he was the richest man alive at one point. And one of his rules is not to gamble. And he made investments that weren't day investments, but long-term moves. And always, as he says, only invest money that you would be okay if you lost it all. If you're going to invest money, invest it when you're, if you're okay, if you lost everything. And so if, if you lost all that, you wouldn't be like ruined. Okay. Otherwise you're just investing and you're gambling and that's something you want to avoid. So you should be saving money. You should have a certain amount of money. That's like more for a safety like type of um, nugget of money, like 30% or whatever. And you should have 10% that's like highly, maybe speculative that could go up 
20 times. And then you can have a, you know, in between there's all these different things you can do with percentage wise. But if you're gambling on highly speculative things with all of your money, or you have to check it daily, welcome to another part-time job, a job where you might not even get paid for all the time you put in. You might lose money. And with all the time that you're spending in it as well, it's just it's such a, it just doesn't make any sense. So it's better to put money into things you feel really, really good about and putting money into, you have a lot of knowledge about, or again, if you're going to go outside the box, use only an amount of money that you have, that if you lost, you wouldn't care much about it. And I recommend, I recommend diversifying money among 20 or so options as a minimum for various categories so that you have a good chance to 10 X or double at least on a few of them. And then if a few of them hit, you make bank, even if a few of them completely go to zero, you're still making a crazy amount of percentage wise, which links to the diversification point that I started out with. And to wrap up here, if you're diversified well, then even if a sector of yours is washed out, it barely affects you. And it's okay if a few times a year, you're up late working on money or something to take care of things here or there. But on the regular, it shouldn't be a thing that's popping into your mind on a regular basis because you wanna use your regular recurring thoughts on attracting your ideal future with what you want by thinking about that most of the time. That's it. Awesome, Jason, good stuff. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> I'm just gonna dive right into my stuff. Uh, before I do, I just want to say thank you to both Jason and Ray. I agree with uh, everything that they both just shared. I think that that's all really great sound advice and wise counsel. And before I get started, I just wanna say on behalf of me, on behalf of uh, Jason, on behalf of Ray and the whole Cutco national community that asked us to step in and help with this message, um, it's important for you to know that none of us are certified financial planners or financial advisors. And so what we're sharing with you today is really just um, from our own personal experience and our own personal perspective. So it is always wise of you to, to make sure that you are also conferring with professionals that you trust. And I see someone asked in the Q&A here, um, how do you find the good ones, right? How do you find the good professionals that can help you with this kind of stuff? And we will be sure to answer that question. But first, I want to just dive into my three tips that I want to share with you guys. Um, and hopefully this will help uh, you. I'm going to take a different approach. So the first thing for me is long-term clarity, right? Get clear on what you want by when you want it and what it would actually take to get there. Amy and I were sitting at a Tony Robbins uh, Wealth Mastery Seminar once and he asked us this question and he said, what do you really want and when do you actually wanna get it by? And we were like, holy crap, like that's a really great question. And we, that's where we sat down and we decided like, we by a certain age in life wanna be in a position where we are making passively four to $500,000 a year. And then he asked, great, so what would it take to actually get there? And we had to sit down and work the numbers backwards to figure out based on percentages and, and you know, in average income from passive income streams or cash flow streams and stuff like that, positive cash flow investments, we had to figure out what it would actually take to get there. And then that's where we realized our net worth needed to be a certain amount and we needed to have multiple different investments across multiple diversified you know, uh, options to be able to have that consistently coming in as passive cash flow for us, to be able to live off that for the rest of our lives and never have to work a single day. So first time <clears throat> that we went just saying and thinking we want to be like, this was the first time we went from just saying and thinking that we wanted to be financially free someday to actually knowing what we needed to do today, what we need to do this week, what we need to do this month or this year to actually get there by a certain time in our lives. So I recommend that you sit down and you ask yourself that question. Where do you want to eventually be at some point in your life and break the numbers down and work it backwards? And if you need help with that, reach out to somebody you know that's already getting the results that you want in their finances and ask them how, have them walk you through how you might be able to figure that stuff out for yourself. Um, that's when we realized that we needed to have $8 million invested into vehicles that provide us with consistent positive cash flow so that we can live off of the earnings, cover all of our expenses, live a high quality lifestyle and not have to work. So people ask me like, hey man, you've been doing this 20 years. 
why are you still working the way that you work right now? And my answer to that is because I'm working towards a long-term future. Like I'm in the crank and bank stages of my life right now. Like I'm young, I'm healthy. I can afford to work hard because the harder I work now, the less I'll have to work later in life. Now that doesn't mean that I don't enjoy life, that I don't take days off or that I live, breathe, eat, drink, sleep and do everything Cutco. No, I take days off every week. I take weeks off every year, multiple months off every year, just like Jason and many other people in this business. But I do it on purpose. I do it with intention. It is all strategically designed to create a specific result and to accomplish a certain thing in my life by a certain time in my life. Um, this is also around the same time that I really challenged myself to set a huge financial vision that would inspire and motivate me to crank and bank and find ways to grow. So, um, you know, that's when I sat down and I said to myself, you know, around that same time that I went to that Tony Robbins seminar, which is about 10, maybe 12 years ago now. But uh, I sat down and I said to myself, like, what is something that would inspire me to wake up every single day? to go out and do something that I've never done before at a higher level than I've ever done it, even if I don't feel like doing it. And that's where I sat down and said, okay, well, I want to make a million dollars by a certain age. 30 years old was the time, was the age at that time. Um, I want to, I want to save a million dollars by 40 and I want to give away a million dollars by 50. And when I said that and wrote it down, I felt this inspiration in me. Whatever it is for you, you need to create a big financial vision that inspires you, motivates you, gets you out of bed every morning. So once you know where you want to be, it's actually much easier to figure out how to get started. And then it's just about taking the first steps. So the second tip I want to share with you is, is um, you know, once you've got clarity, then make purchasing decisions based on facts, not based on feelings, Right. Um, you know, one of the things that, that Amy and I do from a facts-based decision-making standpoint is we always, we always want to be in a net positive position. What does that mean? That means that we always want to be living below our means so that we always have positive cash flow in our lives, even if it's just from our income. So that affords us the opportunity to save more and then, you know, to save more money every single year versus just spending everything that we make and always feeling like we're treading water. So delayed is always better than stretched. That's one of our kind of mantras or principles, right? We'd rather delay gratification now than always feel stretched paycheck after paycheck after paycheck, month after month after month, year after year after year. I'd rather feel the pain of discipline and delayed gratification. I'd rather feel that pain than feel the pain of regret that I wasn't smarter with my money. Right, saying yes to one thing is saying no to something else. Always remember that. If I say yes to the new iPhone for $1,000, I'm also saying no to that $1,000 doing work for me for my future self because I'm not saving that money. If I say yes to the new car, when my current car is working just perfectly fine, maybe it's not as nice or not as fancy, maybe it's a little bit older, maybe it has high miles or whatever, but if when I say yes to that new car, just because I feel like I want a new car, then I'm also saying no at the level of thousands of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars, for some people in this community, even $100,000 or more, to other things that would be vehicles that would afford me the opportunity someday to buy any car I want anytime I want for cash and never even think twice about it. So I'd rather delay that gratification now. You know, one of the things um, that we do when it comes to facts versus feelings-based decision-making is, um, you know, like how we determine bonuses for our team here at Vast Action. Um, we do bonuses at the end of the year. It has nothing to do with the holidays and it has everything to do with analysis of the year. Like Ray was talking about earlier, right? Amy and I sit down, we do financial analysis, both on our personal lives, our business lives, and for our team as well. And, you know, we sit down and we basically say like, hey, how did the business go this year? We pay attention to the numbers. We track where the, where the money's going. We look at our profitability and we make our decision on bonuses based on what we feel we can share with our team through the bonuses. So it's not just some random number they come to expect and feel entitled to. Instead, it's something that we're able to attach a story to, that we're able to say and, and give them as recognition. But we base that all on facts not on what feels good to us or what feels good for the business. Um, so pay attention to the numbers, track where your money is going, review it, spend quality, carefree timelessness 
with like with your money the same way you do that with any important relationship that you want to retain for the rest of your life have fun with your money conversations have fun with your time with your money get creative with your money but be smart and do this for both your personal life and your business. So just like a or uh, Ray shared, like he, he and Nicole sit down and do a financial audit every year. Amy and I do that for our business and our personal lives every single month right now, because we made some big investments the last couple of years that changed our financial landscape. And so we're paying very, very close attention at the moment, just to be sure that we know exactly what's happening, where it's happening, how it's happening. And we know exactly where our cracks and gaps are so we can patch those up, but also so we know where our opportunities are so that we can maximize and capitalize on those opportunities as well. And my third and final tip for you guys that I'll share is get clear on your values. So the reality is, and I think Jason and Ray will both second this, there are a million ways to make money in today's world, right? There's a million ways to do it. Maybe a million to stretch, but there's a ton of ways and it's overwhelming. So you don't, I want to tell you right now that you don't have to do everything that everyone says you should do just because they say you should do it. Where I found confidence, where I got comfortable with exactly what to do with my money amongst the million different options that were constantly presenting themselves, the more and more money that I made every year, was when I sat down and I figured out what makes sense for me and what aligns with my values. I read a book, um, I recommend it to everyone that asks or that I talk about finances with, and it's called um, <clears throat> Values-Based Financial Planning. Sorry, I had to pull that out and for a moment I thought I forgot it. So Values-Based Financial Planning. By that book, it teaches you, it shares with you the questions that you want to ask to uncover and define your own personal financial values. For some of you, it may be related to your kids and the future you want to create for them. For those of you that don't have kids, it may be something completely different. For some of you, it's freedom and flexibility. For some of you, it's investments and making more money and having side hustles. Everybody is different. This is why it's so important to define your own personal values first. And then once you have that clarity, it's easier to align all of your financial decisions with those values. So what makes sense for you? Like, what's your risk tolerance? Are you, are you tolerant of high risk or do you prefer low risk? Amy and I, we're low risk tolerance. We know that about ourselves. Are you long-term or short-term? Like, do you want to invest and hold, like buy and hold and sit for 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Or do you want to make money every few years? Do you want to invest in something and three years later, have it pay you back and invest in something else, right? You need to know these things in order to make decisions that align with your values. Otherwise, you're just throwing money blindly at things, not knowing how you're going to feel about it or how things are going to play out long term. Also, um, align yourself with experts. Who are the experts in the areas that you want to be investing your money once you know what your values are and you're aligning those investments with those values, right? Don't take financial advice from social media. I'm sorry, but I have a lot of friends right now that are like getting all their financial advice from Facebook and Twitter. And I am sorry, but like that is not a good place to do it unless you're in a very specific group that is private and that is based, that is like filled with experts on that specific thing, right? Take your financial advice from people who make a living of knowing what there is in the world and knowing what works and what doesn't work and how to align with values. In fact, when you look for a financial planner, find someone who doesn't just wanna sell you products and services, but who wants to understand you, understand the future you wanna create, understand the values that you, that you hold dear, and then is willing to work with you to make a plan that's customized specific to you to help you get where you wanna go as fast as possible and as profitable as possible. Um, and then also the final thing is don't fall victim to FOMO. All right. I've had it many happen many times where like a financial opportunity presents itself. There's a ton of pressure and urgency around it because obviously the people that have this opportunity want to get the money as quickly as possible. And you, it's very easy to feel rushed and pressured. And it's very easy to make not the best decisions when you're making those decisions under that urgency and pressure. So don't hesitate, take a step back. Don't hesitate to take your time. If you, may, if you need more time to make a decision and you miss the opportunity, then it probably wasn't the right opportunity anyways. It's okay to take a step back and take your time because if you miss this opportunity, trust me when I say another opportunity will present itself.
Okay. I had the opportunity to invest in Pier One last year. And I didn't do it because just we didn't have all the ducks in a row in a way that would make the most sense for us to do it. So instead of investing the hundred thousand dollars I worked for years to save that I wanted to play around with as play money for investments for my future, um, instead of investing that into Pier One. I invested it into the cannabis industry and I'm consistently, I've got a check coming in every single month right now from that investment. And I can see exactly where we'll be and exactly how much we'll make off that investment. So by not making one investment, I had the opportunity to make another investment that is just as good, if not better. So just remember that it's okay. More opportunities will present themselves. So Amy and I personally, we prefer long-term. We prefer lower risk. We prefer a proven track record, um, the types of investments that have a proven track record of investments when we're deciding where to put our money. We like investing in real estate. We like emerging stable markets. We like banking replacement strategies, which is similar to the insurance thing Jason was talking about. Um, we, like, we also prefer to have liquidity and we prefer to have access to that liquidity and we prefer to carry minimal debt. These are like our core financial values. So when we make investments, we make investments that align with those values. We also know these things so that we can make our decisions on what to do with our savings. Um, and we can make sure those decisions are always filtered through the lens of how they align with our values first before we decide what to put money into and all that sort of stuff. So um, that's what I've got for you. Hopefully that's helpful and uh, appreciate you guys' time. <clears throat>